Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the Psalms. Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have been made a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. Now those who were scattered among the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them with all the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. And then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the third gospel, the book of Luke, beginning at chapter 12, starting at verse 8 through verse 12. And I say unto you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Here ends the reading. Today's sermon title, Ignatius of Antioch, Ignorant of the Fear of Death by the Ignoble Emperor, Ignited Flame, or Igneous Rocks. In the book of Acts, we read that the first person who was killed for his faith in Christ Jesus was Stephen. And Stephen was killed by those who pelted stones against him Till he died. And the church remembers the witness of Stephen every December 26th as we sing in that song, Good King Wenceslas Looked Down on the Feast of Stephen. And the book of Acts tells us how Saul of Tarsus, who was there 
at the martyrdom of Stephen looked on with approval and carried that persecution to other places. And from this onslaught of persecutions, the book of Acts tells us that the apostles then and the deacons and others who were following Christ needed to flee from Jerusalem for safety. And one of the places that they traveled to was Antioch. And the gospel took a firm hold in the city of Antioch. And the book of Acts tells us that it was at Antioch, as we just heard this morning, that the believers were first identified as being called Christians. Now, one of the people who belonged to this early congregation at Antioch was a man named Ignatius. And the day that the church remembers Ignatius was yesterday, October 17th. And so we think on his witness in the church this morning. Now, Antioch as a city is located today presently between the countries of Turkey and Syria. It's on the Turkish side, but close to the border. And so it was that when the people from Jerusalem needed to flee outside the country, they went to Antioch and they preached there and the word took shape there and took root. And Ignatius was one of those men who heard the apostles themselves preach the word. And so we're talking about a time then when Ignatius came to uh, be a leader in the church at Antioch, that this is the time immediately following the scriptures. We're guessing that Ignatius lived around, was born probably about the years 50 or 60 A.D., probably concluded his life somewhere in the early 100s. So this is that time just immediately following the scriptures. And the book of Revelation might not have even been written yet. So Ignatius belongs to these early, early leaders, immediately following the close of the scriptures. And these men are called the Apostolic Fathers. They're called that name because they knew the apostles, or at least some of them, personally. Now, Ignatius was a student of John. And he likely knew Peter as well. And he probably knew Barnabas, too, because all of them had traveled to Antioch to share the word. And so it was that because it, this was one of the first places that the gospel went to after leaving Jerusalem and Israel, that this became another center of the church. And so for centuries, the city of Antioch was a place where people came to study the Christian faith, and Ignatius grew in his stature as being a leader and a preacher in that community. And as the churches continued to multiply in that city, the one who had the strongest leadership, who was pastor at the largest congregation or who was the best preacher, he became the leader over the entire city. And that title of the one who led the churches in that city came to be known as the overseer, or as we would sometimes say in English, the bishop. And Ignatius, as the bishop, is overseeing these congregations and their preaching of the scriptures. He encountered at least two major heresies. Two major heresies that we also find in the New Testament themselves that Paul addresses too. And so it was very helpful for Ignatius to have Paul and these other apostles that he could draw from them when refuting their arguments. Now the first argument that the people uh, brought into the congregation that was not the faith that was delivered to them from the disciples was that Jesus Christ really was not a man. These people said, well, Jesus couldn't have been a man. He couldn't have demoted himself to being somebody as lowly as a human being. So, yeah, he looked like a man, he spoke like a man, he ate food, but that was just kind of a hologram, and he really wasn't a man. And so, of course, Ignatius had to preach against this and, and fight against this in his own congregation. As he had reference, and as we have reference as well, that we know that this teaching is not commensurate with the apostolic faith. As the book of 2 John, chapter 1, verse 7 says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. And such a person is a deceiver and is the Antichrist. Those are strong words of condemnation, not just we agree to disagree. Those are strong words of condemnation. And the reason that they had to be strong, because this kind of theology that had seeped into the church, that had snuck into the church, was going to break apart the whole Christian teaching. And so it had to be refuted. So that was the first problem that Ignatius had uh, in the churches. 
was that there was this foreign doctrine that had come in about Jesus Christ really not being a human being. And the second problem that Ignatius faced was those who taught that in order for people to become Christians, they had to become Jews first, you know, and to observe all the kosher laws and the ceremonial laws and all those kinds of things. And so, once again, Ignatius was able to draw upon those who had passed on the faith immediately to him. And so he had the book of Galatians. And what does the book of Galatians have to say about those who teach a Judaizing of the gospel? It says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Here again, strong words. Not just you have your teaching, we have our teaching. And so because of this great heresy, uh, in this formative stage, in the earliest years of the church following the completion of the scriptures, Ignatius had to expel those from these congregations who were teaching this false doctrine. And what did these heretics do? But they had two different uh, possibilities. Some of them would just leave the established congregations and then go off and found their own congregation with their own different teaching. While others were more sneaky and they would just cross town to the other side and join the church over there instead. And so Ignatius, as the overseer, he had to instruct all the pastors, instruct all the leaders, and visit every congregation and tell them, this is not acceptable. This is not the faith that has been handed down to us, like the book of Jude tells us, the faith once delivered and handed over to the saints. They probably didn't even have the Apostles' Creed yet to, you know, to rate what was true teaching and what wasn't, but they had the personal acquaintance because Ignatius had known the apostles. And so these problems kept recycling, and, and, and Ignatius had to assert his authority that he had as being one who had been trained. Now, as Ignatius was dealing with these troubles, he got himself into other troubles, too, not religious troubles. Well, I guess they were religious troubles, too, but they were of a different nature. Now, for some reason, one season that the Roman emperor himself, named Trajan, had come into Antioch and found out that this Christian community now was flourishing because it was still pretty new. I mean, yes, the, the church was established in Rome yet, but it had really taken off in Antioch. And Trajan found out, well, these people aren't honoring the emperor. They aren't worshiping the Roman gods like, you know, Jupiter and uh, Diana. And so the emperor Trajan... He feared that, well, if people, enough people adopt this Christian thing, then we're not going to have sacrifices to the Roman gods, and they're not going to favor us anymore. They're going to bring victory to our enemies. They're going to not bring the rain and the sun and the right amounts to, to grow our crops. And so Trajan ordered that Ignatius would uh, be hauled off to Rome, and he was going to make an example of Ignatius. Ignatius took this situation with great stride. And he refused to bend. He refused to compromise. He did not cave to the pressure. And so when the Roman authorities came to take him away, to march him all the way to Rome, he did not fight. It was just like Jesus when he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane. He put up no struggle against it, simply accepted his fate. Now, Trajan had thought, that he had really done something smart here. That, you know, he couldn't kill all the Christians in the community. There were too many of them now. But if you take out the leader, he thought that's going to make the rest of them fall apart, especially such a strong leader like Ignatius. But Ignatius used that upcoming martyrdom to be a great witness for the church that we still remember today. Ignatius realized that he had been caught in a trap. And by this, I mean that he realized that when he had been accused of not worshiping the emperor, that if somehow he were not punished for this crime that he had been accused of, then people would suspect that he had somehow faltered in the faith if he got released somehow. Because there were Christians in Rome at this time. We remember that Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans. And so some of the Romans wrote to Ignatius in Antioch, and they said, well, we can help you. We can try to use our connections in Rome to try to seek your release. And you would think that Ignatius would have been <laughs> very willing to, okay, please try to rescue me. But Ignatius knew 
that was not the thing for him to do. Because if he had gotten off, if he had been commuted of his sentence, then the people would have thought, oh, he just bribed the officials to let him go, or he really just secretly made the sacrifice in private so nobody could see him. He was just doing it with his fingers crossed in the back. Ignatius realized the calling that was on his life. Just like Jesus Christ himself, you know, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. If this is the way it has to be, so be it. I will be faithful. I will follow you. And then in that next generation, as Peter and Paul and all the apostles gave their lives in service to the gospel, only John was the one who remained, and it was John who then passed on that faith to Ignatius. And so Ignatius saw that he was the next generation in that train to have to be a martyr, a witness for the faith. Now, as Ignatius was being transferred to Rome to await his sentence to be cast into the arena where the lions were, that as he moved from town to town, because he was this well-known person, this overseer, it took many months, or at least weeks anyway, to make this trip. And so as the caravan would come to a city, then the Christians in that city would go to the next city and tell them, hey, Ignatius is here. We need to come out and support him. And this was sort of exciting. He was a celebrity in a sense. You know, we need to come out and we need to listen to him and, and give him our support. And, you know, the Roman soldiers that were bringing him with, they didn't care about what Ignatius was doing as long as he didn't try to, like, you know, escape from their shackles or anything. They didn't really mind what he did for the evening. And so as they would stop, these crowds would gather. Christians would come out from the churches in the area and they came to, to see their leader be in chains. And then, of course, there were those, too, who simply came just to see what was going on. You know, they didn't have all the entertainment and the things that distract like we do today. And so when anybody new was in town, it was news. And so they came to hear. And what a great thing that was. You know, each stop along the way that many Christians were edified and strengthened in their faith. And some of them knew that they were going to face that same consequence, too. That as the persecutions ramped up in the Roman Empire, that they knew that they were going to face this, and they were encouraged that just as uh, Ignatius was going to have to face the lions, so they too had the strength that comes from God to deal with something like this. And then, of course, for all those who came who were just curious and wanted to see what all the fuss was about, and they heard, they heard the message from the man himself, the one who had known the apostles. And so many souls, many souls came to salvation through Ignatius' strong preaching and teaching as he was transported to Rome. Why did they have to bring him all the way to Rome? I mean, the emperor was the one who sentenced him. He could have just ordered that Ignatius be taken outright at Antioch. Why did he have this allow for this publicity and extended travel to go all the way to Rome. Well, in Rome was the Colosseum, where they had their, for sport, was the lions. And, you know, that isn't something that a person would volunteer to subject themselves to. Not like all those, you know, young high school or college students who dream of playing like a professional sport. Completely the opposite. That was the last place you wanted to be. And so they had to try to always find people. There became like this market where we got to be able to keep supplying the arena with people who can be uh, fed to the lions. And so it was then that as Ignatius was led to the Colosseum, the zookeepers there intentionally got the lions worked up. They, you know, in their cages, they would poke sticks at the lions just to get them all agitated, and they wouldn't feed the lions for three days, so they were really, really hungry. And, you know, of course, most people, when they were led into this arena, they were just as scared as could be, and I'm sure that Ignatius was scared as well, but being the man of faith that he was, he didn't scream and holler, he didn't run, he just simply knelt down and the lions came for him, like expected, tore up his body. There were just some broken you know, bones left over from his victimhood, I guess we would say. And, you know, and to think that people were cheering this and getting excited about this and this was fun and sport to them. What a wicked world that we live in. 
and it really isn't that different in our day day and age either. We you know find things that are pretty gruesome to entertain us as well. So some things stay the same. Some things stay the same, but some some things are different. Because in, in in Ignatius's day, the f- there were a few Christians who went to see the his bones be ripped apart and broken and all that, and they went there not because they wanted to see how gory and crazy it was they were there because they wanted to take his remains home and give him a dignified type of burial or interment and so they wrapped up the few bones that they could put together because some of them had just been scattered all around the arena and carried them in a in a blanket and took them home and at least at home that ignatius was honored posthumously for his great martyrdom and his great witness to the world. So we think about these stories and praise God that we at this time and at this place do not have to face those kinds of consequences. I cannot imagine how incredibly painful it was to see large beasts coming at you, how scary that would be and for them to just rip apart every bone in your body. And when you think of that, when you think of how Stephen was martyred by having stones pelting him to death, when you think of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, dying about as slow a death as a one could possibly do by asphyxia, he couldn't breathe, that's what finally killed him. He suffocated on his own weight. When we think of these things, it kind of puts life in perspective, does it not? Does it not give us a sense of, I can handle my problems. Yes, my problems are painful. My problems are difficult. I might be dying. I might feel extreme guilt for something that I did 20, 30 years ago. I might be a widow mourning the loss of my loved one. All these things are painful. Those who have suffered abuse, it is not in any way to diminish your troubles. Because you know how painful things are. Because even think of Jesus himself, the one who endured the cross for as long as he did. But yet he still had the emotions too. Because what did he do at his friend Lazarus' death? But it tells us that Jesus wept. And so God still continues to call each one of you to bring your cares and your concerns to him. And that's why we do so as a body of Christ, that we pray for one another. We support one another. Because that's what it takes to get through this difficult world. So that's the first thing that we can be reminded of this morning, that we can praise God. Each one of you in this room right now can at least think, yes, the times don't look great for Christians. Yes, the church is declining in the world. I mean, Antioch, I mean, that just fueled the church as they learned about uh, Trajan and as people continued to take the gospel to different places. The church grew, the church flourished. People wanted to hear about this kind of message. It was so compelling. It was so different than anything that they had ever heard. Not so in our present day and age. As the church declines, as people are uninterested, as they are distracted by things that are just as about as worthless or as wicked as the lions in the arena. But we can give thanks to God that God has still not abandoned his church. It might be a smaller church. It might be a church that does not exert the same influence on society that it once did. But God has still blessed his people. And he's still given us a church where we can gather, where we can freely hear the word, where we can come and pray together. We can support missionaries to take that word into places that still are receptive to hear the word of God. So we think about the gratefulness that each one of us should have. I hope that you have for your religious liberty. Whatever the state of that might be in the future, we thank God for today. We thank God for today that we can still take the message out. And we also think of witness. We also think of Ignatius' witness this morning because Ignatius laid it all on the line. He knew that he could not, in good conscience, get himself out of that situation. Even if his friends in Rome could have somehow uh, manipulated the situation and gotten him freed so that he didn't have to face the lion's He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it because he knew that there would be those who would say he didn't do it for the right reasons. He cared about his witness. He cared about what people thought 
in, a, in an important way, not in what you think about, you know, how much money you have or what, um, what your job is or all those kinds of, you know, temporal things. But he cared about his reputation. Do you care about your Christian witness? Are you careful about how you would lead somebody astray? Do you praise the Lord on Sunday and curse the Lord on Monday? Do you claim to be a Christian but never give in support of the congregation? Do you love Jesus? Do you love the people of God and like coming to church? But do you hate your brother? Do you mistreat your loved ones? Are you rude to your coworkers? Witness is so important. We should not tear each other down either in the house of God or in our own homes. Yes, there is a place for rebuke. There is a place, as Ignatius did, when those peoples were bringing in those false doctrines that were threatening the very existence of the preaching of the gospel. Then he had to step forward and say, no, we cannot have this. He rebuked those. He excommunicated those who preached those false doctrines. Why? Why did he have to be, why was that such a big deal? Why didn't he just let them have their church here and we have our church here and that kind of thing? Because he knew that the gospel message and all that, entail, that is entailed with it is connected. Being of sound doctrine is not just for the satisfaction of knowing that I've got it figured out or I go to the right kind of church or I've read and studied my Bible enough that I know what's right and what's wrong about teaching. That's not the point. The point is that if Jesus Christ was not God, and if he had not come down as a man, then he could not have assumed human nature. That if he was just pretending to be man, like these people were saying at Ignatius' time. If he were not really a man, then he couldn't serve as a substitute for you who are men and women. It has to be, a substitute has to be like substituting for like. So your sins would not be forgiven. You would not be reconciled to God. You would have no peace in your heart. You would be like the hopeless ones who were fed to the lions because they were criminals, and they had no hope of anything. The only hope was to have this done and over with as quickly as possible. And so these are important matters when it comes to the preaching, uh, the doctrines of the church. And finally this morning, we are reminded of the importance of encouraging one another. We think again of Ignatius as he went from town to town as they traveled and those people came to, to support him and pray for him in person and as he preached to them and he also wrote to them too. And we have some of his writings and they're not written very well. Unlike the Gospels, you know, like, I mean, like the Apostle Paul, you know, when those sentences are so strung out, they're long, they're complicated thoughts, they're detailed, they're complex. But these were just simple things because he didn't have time. He just had to quickly write something and then hand it off. And so that's how the gospel also spread. And so we think of that great witness and that great edification that took place on both, that he strengthened the believers, that the believers also came and encouraged him to remain faithful, to remain true. Don't give up the fight. Be courageous all the way to the lion's arena. And so that's what we do as, as Christians too. Yes, none of you are facing the lion's den, but you're facing your own problems. You've got your health concerns. You've got your financial difficulty. You've got mental illness. You've got troubles with whatever problem you have in life. We could just make a list that would go on and on and on. Your worries, your concerns about this world, you could just keep going on. But we come together and we support one another and we share the gospel with one another. This isn't just a social club. This is we, we come here not to just drink coffee, but we come here to hear something, to be edified, and to pray for one another and encourage one another and to do things together, to work in missions, to get that gospel out to people who would listen. We understand in this day and age, unlike uh, Ignatius' day and age, where people were actually interested in hearing about this gospel, we understand why the church has declined for many reasons. We think of scandals like uh, the church covering up and, you know, and sweeping sex scandals under the rug. Or we think of those high publicity pastors who have these million-dollar churches you know, and million-dollar homes and need million-dollar jets to fly around to do their ministry. And we, so we understand why people are skeptical. and They're like, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to give my money 
towards that. But that's not what being a Christian is about. Obviously, it's about it's ma- making those personal connections so people know that what a Christian is like through your words, of course, in sharing and testifying, but also just in people seeing your life, having that witness there again, that we just encourage one another and then we take that back to our homes and our workplaces and our neighborhoods and we encourage each other and share with them the real gospel, not the prosperity gospel, not the gospel of I'm okay, you're okay, and isn't life just wonderful, not the power of positive thinking, not social revolution for the sake of we're just going to do politics with a little bit of church covered over to make it look like it's not church. We proclaim the gospel, the real gospel, the one that's worth dying for, the one that Ignatius was willing to yield his life for and and be tortured in unspeakable ways. So blessed be Ignatius, teacher, ample of the church. And blessed be all those who die in the fear of the Lord, in the fear and wonder of the Lord. For Christ is worth truly dying for. Whether you're going to be crucified, whether that death be stoning, being burned alive, being tortured, being decapitated, being fed to the arena of lions, or as in your case, more likely, a cancer diagnosis, a car accident, uh, a heart attack. All those things still are worth dying for so that your sins could be dead with you. Because as the scriptures say, only those who are dead are dead to their sins. And then to be raised again in that hope that Ignatius had and that hope that the early church had and that same hope that I pray that you have in your hearts, that Jesus Christ is the hope not only for this life and all the troubles that you face and the worries that you have, but also for the hope of the life of the world to come. And that is the only hope that this world cannot take away from you.